The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He is the green chicken himself <laughs> right, right there. I love the animated version of it, too. But it is <laughs> or he or it is Doomberg. So Doomberg, welcome back to the show, buddy. George, how are you? Great to be back. Um, uh, my chicken pronouns are he, him, so feel well, free to use those. See, I was um, getting confused there. I'm so used <laughs> to dealing with Moody the Millennial. I, I want to make sure I get those pronouns right. I, you, know, you know what's funny is people do tell us that after a few minutes, it does seem like the green chicken is actually doing, doing the talking. So uh, investing in this <laughs> in this animation was a very high ROI for the brand. So uh, I appreciate, appreciate being back and I always have a blast when we chat. Looking forward to a great discussion today. Yeah, so I reached out to you the other day on Twitter because I was trying to get my head around what was going on in the crypto space. So why don't we go ahead and start there? And then I want to move on to the article that I think you published today on the chemical giant BASF in Germany and how what's going on with the Russian natural gas plays into their input costs and how that may affect the German economy. So let's start with, you know, kind of what's going on in crypto. Let's go back to, uh, let's just say Bitcoin going down and then what happened to Celsius and kind of all these knock on effects that we saw and what we're seeing today. Yeah, great, uh, great question. And looking forward to both discussions. And, and you're right, it is publication day for us, which is always hectic. Uh, but now we're recording this late in the afternoon. And so things have died down a bit. And so, um, but yeah, happy to talk about both. So let's start with crypto, like you described, and and as we were. Um, chatting before we turned on the recorder. Um, what's really going on in the crypto world today is very fascinating and in many yeah. ways somewhat admirable. It's a it's a, it the analogy that that we're researching for a potential piece is this is the global financial crisis of 2008 2009, but without central bank intervention. Um, right. And so losses are being realized and leverage is zeroed out and you know people are getting bailed in for for you know worse consequences for them, but at least it's sort of, you know, the, the frauds are being exposed and people are losing their money in a sort of very, very raw form of capitalism. And there's two ways to look at that. One is, hey, that's great. Capitalism is capitalism. There's no government to save you. Um, if you're an adult and you thought that 20% yields on a savings account were sustainable, then maybe you deserve to lose your money. Um, the flip side to that is, you know, regulations exist for a reason and regulations exist, at least in theory, to protect people um, from swindlers and fraudsters and from taking excess risks that they might not realize they're taking. And so it's a really fascinating thing to observe. Um, you mentioned Celsius. We wrote a piece uh, on June 17th called When Fahrenheit, you know, because um, all of these Ponzi's that tend to collapse have a rebirth and a second bite at the apple like uh, like Luna Terra did, which is just really another remarkable story. So at its core, what we're seeing is um, total wildcat banking, total free, unfettered um, speculation, fraud, um, and it's a slice of innovation. You know, I, I was chatting with um, our good friend Grant Williams about this, um, and he was actually thinking about writing a similar piece on the topic, which is, um, it's just really this amazing, you know, we're going to go through a flush here. Um, the contagion is amazing. The analogy is sort of what would have happened if the central bankers, you know, if the Fed hadn't bailed out AIG, for example, and stopped the contagion in its tracks. Because we suspect, of course, you would have seen Goldman tip over and then all of the other big investment banks that suddenly became, you know, regulated banks overnight so that they could get bailed out by the Fed. Um, what survives this is going to be a very interesting potential investment opportunity, I think. Mm, I mean, that's, totally. um, you know, like there's going to be a complete washout. And who knows where Bitcoin will bottom? Maybe it's a thousand, maybe it's a hundred, maybe it's 10,000, maybe 20,000 is the bottom and where it's been floating for the past few weeks. I don't know. Like, that's why we don't trade markets. But there will be a bottom. Um, there will be a washout. But there is technical innovation going on in the space. Um, there are a lot of really smart people working in it. And when you have complete capitulation, what survives that is kind of like picking up Amazon after the, the dot-com bubble, you right. know, potentially. Um, and so this is really just an amazing thing to watch in real time. Uh, we are no coiners. I don't have any wallets. Nobody on our team has wallets. We're fascinated by crypto. We write about it occasionally. 
um, were mostly energy um, and commodity related, but crypto is just so fascinating and, and frankly brings eyeballs. You know, there's a, lot, a lot of people are interested in it. Um, so yeah, it, it's really fascinating. I'm not sure if you have a different view, but to us, what's, what's playing out right now is kind of like a, a, a replay of 0809, but with no intervention. Yeah, it's really a neat spin on it. And it makes me more optimistic about the future of the space. Maybe not, you know, who knows what happens in the next year or two, because I'm, I, I understand that capitalism and free market capitalism more specifically is not perfect. And a lot of people get hurt and you referred to it as kind of like the wild, wild west. And I agree, but I, I would rather have that than the latter with all of the intervention with the central planners, because I think on net balance, we're far better off in the wild, wild west, even if some people do unfortunately uh, get ripped off. But as you were saying that, I was thinking about a, a Schumpeter's creative destruction, where essentially the bad actors go bust and the people that were more prudent or the entities that were more prudent take over the assets of those who are not and the whole system becomes stronger and more sustainable for the long term. So that that's why uh, interesting take that kind of has got me thinking and maybe more optimistic on the space long term. But I would also say, let's not minimize like there, especially with entities like Celsius, which were advertising themselves as you know very low risk, um, banking the unbanked, um, can't lose, you know, put all of your savings. They were selling ultra risky investment products as savings accounts, essentially. Right. Um, I'm not saying morally that's correct, but right. the, the one thing I do like about that though is because it is let's assume there are all these people that were just kind of selling oceanfront property in Arizona. Uh, but if they're allowed to get away with it, and I'm not saying they should or they shouldn't, but in the <laughs> next cycle, people are going to be far more leery and they're going to do more due diligence themselves. Where if the, the central planners come in and let's say they were to uh, prop up Celsius and then just uh, you know put that guy in jail and make everyone whole, something like that. Yeah. I would argue that then people, although that may save the, the people who got, um, let's say, sucked up into a potential fraud, it may save their butts. But in the long term, you know, fast forward three years, five years, people, it's like the FDIC insurance type thing, right? Where people are going to throw their money at this again, and you just get a cycle where it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, instead of people in the next cycle st uh, standing back and saying, whoa, whoa time out. I remember what happened before. I remember all the people that went bust. I'm going to be very, very careful, and I'm going to use my own risk management instead of delegating that, delegating that to the FDIC. I, I agree, and um, and we will. Ironically, one of these firms was touting that they were FDIC backed. By the way, which is, so <laughs> um, I believe, it's Voyager. And the fine print, of course, is that the accounts where Voyager were handling their cash. That bank was backed by the FDIC, but that doesn't mean that anybody sucked up into the Voyager bankruptcy right. can rely on the FDIC for a bailout. It's just funny that you should use that phrase, but I agree. And the nice thing about this wildcat sort of free-for-all that we're seeing in the crypto space is we're going to run that experiment. So in five years, mm -hmm. if the space is orders of magnitude, better, cleaner, more efficient, more innovation, changing the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then you, um, then you, then, then the thesis will be validated. It is a true raw, as we would say in, in science, it's a controlled experiment. Like it, yeah. we're getting it. Um, the variables are controlled and we're going to see now, look, the regulators might not allow what survives this to persist. Um, they might stomp on it while it's down. And so it's not like this is totally, you know, free and clear. But um, for sure, um, people are taking the L's, as you would say. You know, there's no Uncle Sam coming to bail Goldman Sachs out. Um, you know, three arrows, hedge fund, ghosts people and disappears after claiming to have 10 billion in assets under management. The contagion of that collapse is just rippling through um, the entire, you know, um, um, crypto lending space, which is heavily interconnected with, just, you know, DeFi and it, it's, you know, and, but meanwhile, I would say the price of Bitcoin's held up pretty good. <laughs> All, <laughs> All things, things considered. considered. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the type of wipeouts that we're seeing, um, we'll see. I think um, we said this on Twitter and we've written about it many times and it always annoys people when we say it or a certain subset of the crypto fanatics when we say it, which is, 
I, I, I when you think about what are the milestones of a, of a flush out capitulation, I don't know that a world where tether is still a thing uh, mm. means that means that we've gotten to the other side of it. Um, you know, that's the big shoe to drop. Um, and so once sort of um, tether is no longer a thing and stable coins are audited on a regular basis, um, then I think it would be interesting time. And, and look, one of the things we've learned through this amazing experience has been, um, I've gotten to know some Bitcoin maxis, some pure Bitcoin maxis, sort of not the, the grifters that attach themselves to Bitcoin. And um, I respect a lot of them and, and been on a few of their podcasts. And um, there is a difference between, at least in their eyes, between Bitcoin and altcoins and between, you know, Bitcoin and crypto and Bitcoin and, 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 and um, decentralized finance. Um, the Bitcoin algorithm is still running as it always has and, and they claim always will. Um, it is a negative drag because the miners need to pay for their energy in fiat, um, but um, the, the true Bitcoin maxis don't feel as though the recent crash is A, anything that they are unaccustomed to, and B, anything that invalidates the thesis uh, that serves as the foundation of their belief in Bitcoin. And so it's been really fascinating to sort of um, understand the differences and 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 the camps and, and what they believe and what they say. And, and I'll hand it to the Bitcoin maxis. They are uh, consistent and they are um, firm in their beliefs. And so in a way, it's, it's quite admir admirable. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a few of those guys in there uh, that I think would qualify that I would consider good friends and just really, really, really smart dudes. That's for sure. So I hate to lump everyone into the, into the same group. Okay, so then if you could just briefly go over like what the business model was of um, Terra Luna. Because I know you guys did a deep dive, you and Grant with a, a couple other gentlemen that were incredibly smart. And then maybe what the business model was with Celsius and why those two just didn't pan out. Well, they're related. Uh, the collapse of one led to the contagion uh, and the and the seems like collapse of the other. So the the uh, discussion you're referring to is a podcast that, that we recorded with Grant called This Week in Doom. Yeah. And our guests on that podcast were Bennett Tomlin, who is a, a savant of a sort of crypto critic. Yeah, for and sure. Has, has an incredible, like a, a encyclopedic memory. of. I was wondering uh, if he was reading from a script. No, when I was no, listening this is, to that. I'm like, he has to be reading from a script. He's just so <laughs> sharp. Yeah. No, uh, we were watching him on video. It was all from memory. Um, <laughs> and then we also had George Noble on, who is um, sort of an expert in market structure and comes from sort of traditional investing background. And um, the Terra Luna thing is really, you know, I can't do it justice like Bennett could, but it, it was an algorithmic stable coin um, that tried to wrap itself in Bitcoin. Um, and algorithmic stable coins, many believe, including Bennett, are fundamentally flawed um, because they um, are susceptible to sort of um, bank runs. And because there's no underlying asset. There's, yeah, it's essentially a Ponzi scheme. So, sort of a, what's the best way to explain it? It is literally a Ponzi scheme hoping to outrun and reach escape velocity. Mm. And anybody with a big enough stack can take it down. And uh, that seems to be what happened here. Um, but the, you know, in order to attract um, money in, like all Ponzi schemes, they, they offered it a huge yield. And so that means, and people had to sort of, you know, stake their, stake their, their crypto um, and they get um, yield in return. And then they are like, all of these sort of projects have like ecosystems and lots of language and, but ultimately what it comes down to is if you, you know, if you're, if your outflow is greater than your inflow, then your upkeep is your downfall. Right? And so right. um, this thing collapsed and a lot of people got trapped in it, including, I believe, um, you know, Celsius, who was basically a crypto lending firm. Um, I think three I mean, arrows got caught up in that too. Three arrows got caught up in it. So directly or indirectly, Celsius got caught up in it. Either they did or or some firm that they had um, you know, lent money to turned around and tried to get that yield. It's all right. interconnected, right? And right. so right. Um, we've been had this mental model for a long time of the sort of what is the total fiat, hard fiat trap in crypto world? And then what is the mark to market value of what people think they own? And that ratio is kind of like the same leverage that you found with investment banks in 0809. It's the same phenomenon, right? And so mm. and once people run for the exits, um, that, that ratio actually grows. So I would say at Bitcoin 20,000, 
the ratio of, even though the total value of the crypto universe is cut by 65%, 70%, let's say from three to 1 trillion, the ratio of the value of the crypto universe divided by the hard fiat floating in it is probably increasing as it comes mm. down, as people run to the exit, because you're taking right. stuff out of the denominator um, just as fast as you're taking stuff out of the numerator. And um, so that's what I mean by washout too. Like until that really washes out, you still have some of this, this, um, this excess floating around in the system. There will be a number. Bitcoin's not a zero. Bitcoin's not worthless. Bitcoin has network value. Bitcoin has marketing value and brand value. It's not zero. Um, I don't know that it's twenty thousand, and I don't know we'll find that we'll find out what the real answer is until Tether goes out. But you know, Terra Luna. Um, you know, was kind of like, uh, I would say, Lehman Brothers in the mm. analogy, to stretch the analogy perhaps too far. <laughs> but, um, and then Free Arrows is AIG, except the government didn't bail them out. And then now you're having all of the contagion tied to that. And then when these people tip over, the contagion continues. And the last person standing, sort of the, the Ben Bernanke here, is this character, Sam bankman fried who's um, you know, FTX, and buying all of these assets on the cheap and um, backstopping a few of these exchanges and, and, and uh, allowing for, you know, um, customer withdrawals to be met. Um, but at the same time, he's going to end up owning all of the valuable real estate in the crypto world, um, assuming he sort of executes his plan to completeness. And so it's really fascinating to watch back to our, my, my opening answer to your first question. You know, I just, um, as a market observer, this is just really an incredible, um, an incredible theater to watch you, know, you feel like i'm at you know on a broadway watching an incredible act and it's 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 um since we have no money on the line personally um it makes it a little easier to watch observe enjoy learn um and and try to sort of switch our mental models appropriately as things evolve yeah it just reminds me of so many interviews i heard with jim rogers when he would discuss what happened during the GFC and he'd say, listen, they just, they should have let him go bust. And then what you would have happened, what would have happened is the good actors would have taken over the assets from the bad actors. And like we said earlier, the system gets stronger and it seems like that's what's doing, on, what's going on potentially with this Sam, I'm not sure his last name, gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So he would be an example of maybe a good actor. I'm not sure how he yeah. made his money, but I, I guess he's like a billionaire that's taking his billions of dollars and just buying these assets on the cheap. Um, wow. I don't know how he didn't get caught up in the same system. <laughs> but, I think uh, that's a, I think that's a story that remains to be told. Um, mm. George, it's, uh, you know, he, he, he runs FTX, which is an exchange and on the side also runs Alameda research, which is this big hedge fund. And there's lots of questions about how he has accumulated the fortune that he has. And as you know, on these exchanges, I'm not making any specific accusations about FDX, but there's an awful lot of front running of customers and, and um, you know, the, the rug pulls and, and um, you know, when you see huge moves in Bitcoin, it's usually sort of um, getting out all the sort of the stops and they give people all this leverage. There's a lot. Um, he, he's the second biggest donor to Joe Biden for a reason. Let's put it that way. I don't know if you knew that, but he is, he was the second largest donor to Joe Biden's um, election campaign in the last cycle. And, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, huh. a, you, you're not donating as much money as he's donating unless you anticipate the need for some protection. Yeah. There you go. Well, good point. Fantastic point. So I guess the jury's still out there. <laughs> but all right. <laughs> all right. So let's move on to today's story. It was super fascinating, very topical. Uh, just as topical as kind of the crypto crash. And that's what's going on between Germany and Russia and natural gas. So you want to yeah. give us kind of the, the Reader's Digest version. We can dive into that awesome, awesome story. Yeah. So we tried to write a piece today that sort of crystallizes the consequences of bad energy policy in a way that really drives it home. Um, because it's difficult to do that sometimes. Like you see, we've been on this for a year, like this is a crisis that will manifest in real and painful ways for society, European society first, but we'll feel it too. This is a global um, echo that, that will, you know, the sound wave will, will crash upon us soon enough. Um, so the piece we wrote today is about a, a giant chemical company that we know well, BASF. They're the largest chemical company in the world. And the chemical industry is much maligned 
and is also absolutely and totally critical to modern life. Like literally everything I'm looking at on the shelves behind you was made at a chemical plant. Yeah. You, know, it's, you know, the wood, of course, but the paint and the frames and the plastic and this, like the clothes you're wearing, most almost all, you know, there's certainly a lot of cotton clothes, but there's a lot of synthetic clothes. Um, uh, almost everything in modern life has found its way through a chemical plant. And um, the industry does a terrible job of branding itself and, and that it is what it is. But um, BSF uh, runs what we what are known as Verbund sites. So these are um, super large integrated sites. And we go into the piece and explain the genesis of such sites and why they have evolved to become sort of the, the dominant players in the chemical industry. And a, a Verbund site like the one in Ludwigshafen, which is one of my favorite words, um, is this mega large, you know, 2000 buildings, 200 factories, basically a city within a city that is integrated, interconnected, molecules are flinging all over the place. And at that one site in Ludwigshafen, and there's there's at least one Verbund in every major region. So there's what, you know, the, the BSF plant in Germany, there's the, the Dow plant in Freeport, there's the Dow Saudi Aramco joint venture plant in Jabal uh, called Sidera. There's uh, BSF and, and um, a, a giant Chinese chemical company have a JV in, in Nanjing. These sites are huge. And so just to give you some round numbers, um, the Luxvikhaven site produces 20 billion pounds of stuff a year, right. like three pounds for every living human comes right. out of this one little 10 square kilometer site. This site is so big and so integrated and so critical to supply chains that it has internally to the site three natural gas cogeneration plants that make electricity and steam, which is also really important. You know, heat is really important for running industrial processes like this. It has three world scale power plants embedded in the site. Um, and that site, because of Europe's folly and its blunders in the energy space, is at risk of shutting down completely, which is something they've never actually done and they're not even sure how they're going to do it. Right. because they can't keep the site running without Russia's natural gas. So when we write critically about the idiocy of, and let's just say it, it's idiotic what the Europeans have done, the idiocy of, of European and German energy strategies in particular um, is going to manifest itself in real consequences. And if Luxwickhofen shuts down, um, that is going to be, a significant inflationary pulse at a time when central bankers um, can barely afford it, can least afford it. But also, unpredictably, we're going to see shortages. We don't know what product on the shelves today can trace back to a single supplier uh, situation at Luxury Top. Hmm. And so um, you pick your favorite paints or coatings or. But I, I mean, is it fair to say that if you combined the two, BASF and Dow, you're you're probably and I'm I'm just throwing a number sure. out there, but but it could be like touch like eighty percent of the products that you buy at Walmart. Like um, it's like at that scale. Well, they would have significant market share such that it would disrupt about eighty percent of the products. They're not alone. Yeah. The companies combined, I would guess. 130 billion in revenue, 140 billion in revenue. So that kind of number coming offline. Now, Dow is actually going to benefit from this. So let's be very clear. Like um, the competitors to BSF, these products have high inelastic demand um, type behavior, which means, you know, if, if and it, it's a big if, if, if Lucy Hobbing comes offline for any period of time, the competitors who supply similar products from different sites are going to benefit greatly in the same way that, you know, US fertilizer manufacturers are benefiting from the natural gas crisis in Europe because fertilizer is a global commodity and their input costs are back integrated to the US. You know, Freeport, Texas has natural gas. The US is, is swimming in natural gas and they will be able to take not only share, but at a much higher price from BSF if, if, if Luxushaven comes offline. Um, but that's what I mean by inflationary pulse. It's going to be at a much higher price. The, the, these, the commodities involved here have a very, very inelastic demand profiles. And so you could see a doubling or tripling of, of key input costs for formulators downstream. So imagine you make a detergent and it's got a formula that's got 10 ingredients 
and you've researched this formula and you've tested it in the lab and it's really great at lifting stains out of clothes, you know. Um, and let's just say one of those ingredients, um, which you think uh, you're buying from three different suppliers, but in reality, those three suppliers are all sourcing the key input into that ingredient from the same site. Right. As we said in the piece, you know, fourth party risk is going to be a, a, a word that you're going to see in the vernacular here pretty soon. Um, you think you're, you've got uh, a balanced set of three different suppliers when in reality you are single source to Ludwigshafen and you can't make that formulation without that one ingredient, then it's not going to be on the shelf. Did you remember during COVID when Lysol spray was gone for so long? Um, just random shortages of things. Um, there was obviously a high demand for Lysol, but there must have been a missing ingredient somewhere that got caught up in the supply chain crisis because normally companies would be able to respond to price increases like this. Um, by spurring more demand. Um, so we're not just talking about high prices, we're talking about shortages. And it, there's so many products coming out of a, a, a Verbund site like the one in Lufthansaufen that um, it's just difficult to model, it's impossible to model. But I can tell you, it will be random, there will be shortages, it will surprise you. Um, and then on top of all of that, there's the inflationary pulse of the big commodities they produce. So just as an example, they produce a lot of ammonia there. Now it's only about a half percent of the world's supply of ammonia. Ironically, ammonia, the, the Haber-Bosch process to, to make ammonia was invented there. And that's one of the ironies of the piece that we talk about, that this is going to be a victim of the sort of reverse of globalization, this, this product that enabled so much globalization. It might only be a half to 1% of global ammonia supply, but you take that offline and the price goes up by way more than 1%. That's what I mean no, by right. inelastic. And so there's a lot of big bulk commodities that prices will go up, but then the real issue is these specialized products, hundreds and hundreds of them that many downstream formulators, consumer products companies that think they're you know, well diversified in their supply base, you're gonna find out that they're not. And most importantly, you have a 160 year old company, um, a third of their production comes out of that one plant that just gives you how big this plant is, you know, that, European policymakers could so screw up their energy policy to put a site like this that has operated for 160 years and served the world so gloriously that they could jeopardize this is really sad. In Just a, way. a virtue signal. It's 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 a it's a, it's a not a it's a it's a it's a signpost. Yeah, of, of how far the European intellectual elite have fallen and how much of a collapse. Um, their foolhardy policies uh, are bringing. It, it's just really, in some ways, unbelievable to watch. But the overarching feeling that we have is, is sadness. It's just disturbing. And it's how quickly a civilization could jeopardize itself. It's just really sad. And by the way, it could happen here. Like, let's not fool ourselves. Like, we're not, we're blessed with two things, uh, robust energy supplies, and the fact that the states dictate more of the regulations than even the feds do. And that's why you're seeing places like Texas and Louisiana able to produce as much energy as they are, and frankly, able to participate in cushioning the blow for Europe through our exports. Um, but we're, we're not that far away from them if, if, we, if we vote wrong and if we allow our, our idiotic politicians to, to impose stupid policies upon us. Uh, it, one of the reasons that motivated us to start Bloomberg in the first place was to be a voice of sanity in this sea of insanity. It's just right. uh, really remarkable. Yeah, you know, just going back to those European politicians, it's just, uh, I remember when this whole thing started, you know, what, three or four months ago, and I was coming out on Twitter and doing videos saying that there, these policies with the sanctions and just, you know, freezing the assets of the Russian central bank, et cetera, et cetera, or freezing their dollars. So they're not going to uh, have any incentive to sell that natural gas to you for dollars because why they're, you're just going to freeze their account. That doesn't make sense. And uh, you know, everyone, their pushback was always, well, George, we have to do something. Well, we have to do something. We can't just let Putin do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, okay, I, I get it. I get it. But what you don't want to do is something that will have zero negative effect on Russia and a massive, tremendous negative effect on the poor middle class of the, Europe and potentially the United States. It's like, I always use the example of going in and trying to fight Mike Tyson. And instead of punching him, you're punching yourself in the face while he's punching you. 
it's, you know, so it's like let's let's start by not punching ourselves in the face yeah. and then going from there well we put out a piece on june 1st called crazy pills where we described how stupid our policy is but it's one thing to critique but at least when we critique we have an alternative and our alternative is this is very simple uh, in that piece, we described two simple axioms. Oh, this is great. This um, is great. I remember I listened to the, you talk to Grant about this. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very simple axioms, which is, um, first of all, the, the Putin is funding his war machine by selling energy. Everybody agrees. The second axiom is the world cannot live without Putin's a energy. Like it just it can't. And we're seeing that happen in Germany today. This is what we mean when we say things like that. We're not just being hyperbolic. And so with our commodity experience, one thing you learn when you work in commodities is price matters way more than volume because these products are inelastic. And so in the commodity world, it doesn't take much of a shortage for price to skyrocket. Mm -hmm. Conversely, in the commodity world, it doesn't take much of an excess of supply for prices to crater. And if you assume that the world cannot live without Putin's energy, and you assume therefore that Putin's energy will find its way to the market because it will, then the only way to hurt Putin, to shrink the revenue that's funding his war machine is to hammer him on price. Right. And the only way to hammer him on price is to open the spigots. If we, if Biden stood in front of a microphone tomorrow with all of the CEOs of the major oil and gas companies in the West, and made a commitment for a temporary pulse of new drilling, new refining. We're going to pass executive orders and work with Congress to pass laws. We're gonna write executive orders and work with Congress to pass laws to free up the industrial might of the United States and our allies in Europe to produce more energy because we're at a time of war. Just the risk premium would be wiped out of the oil market, 20, 30, $40 a barrel. That would hammer Putin. If we, and by the way, people think because we write about energy and energy prices are going up that we're happy about that. We, we would like energy to be cheap. We would like oil to be at $40 so that consumers can spend so that Putin's war machine is defunded. Um, it's silly what we're doing. So in the piece we lay out the following axiom, which is anything, any behavior or decision on the part of a Western politician that increases the price of oil enables Putin. And any action or behavior on the part of a Western politician that decreases the price of oil hurts Putin. So in that context, does threatening the industry with windfall taxes, yeah. all things being equal, increase or decrease the price of oil? Does um, you know revoking permits? Does uh, yeah, stimmy checks? You know, does if, if, if on the flip side, any behavior that increases the demand for energy enables Putin? Right. And any behavior that decreases the demand for energy hurts Putin. Does passing a stimmy check in California, $1,050 for every, uh, that enables Putin. So it's just undeniable. Um, Joe Biden and Gavin Newsom are Putin enablers. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and so if Putin is the boogeyman and Putin is the person we're at war with and Putin needs to be defunded, then you should behave accordingly. You should get on TV and tell the American people that it's time to tighten our belts and Get your Jimmy Carter sweatshirt on and talk about lower thermostats. The president would like it both ways, three ways, actually. Um, he wants energy to be cheap, but he doesn't want any new drilling. He wants uh, Americans to suffer nothing. So we shall make no sacrifice. $5 gas is unacceptable. Um, and he shall not anger his environmental um, foundation, his base. Right. You, you can't, it's like a three-legged stool, pick, pick one at most, maybe two, you can't have all three. He's trying to have all three. <laughs> and it's not gonna, it's just not gonna work, it's stupid. And it's gonna cost him politically, uh, big yeah. time. It is costing him politically, big time. And it's so plainly obvious, like if anybody with one, it's very clear to me that nobody in the administration has one ounce of experience in heavy industry and that's scandalous. Energy is life, energy is the heartbeat of the economy. If you screw up energy, you screw up your economy, just ask the Germans. What would you say to someone who pushed back and said, okay, Doomberg, I get what you're saying, but isn't this a great argument for the West setting up this buyer's cabal, if you will, I, where, I they're, where they're only willing to pay X price for Putin's oil? Wouldn't that do the same thing? Wouldn't that stick it to them? Yeah, okay. That's the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my life. I mean, I, 
if you asked me a year ago, would the Secretary of the Treasury Department, Janet Yellen, come out and say, we're going to put a price cap on Russian oil or we're going to form a buyer's cabal? Last right. I checked, if you desperately need a product and that product is short, the side with the power is the people with the product. Like it's, I don't know, I don't, maybe you understand it. Maybe you can explain it. Enlighten me, George. How is this supposed to work exactly? It's just political theater in my opinion. It's bullshit. I mean, let's be honest. I don't mean to swear on your, on your family friendly show, No, um, but it is total BS. It's insane. It, it, it has to be theater because if they believe it's possible, it's even scarier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know what's worse, like that they would say it or that they believe it. Well, I guess yeah. I know what that they, if they believe it, it's worse, that they'd say it is dumb enough. Um, imagine the chuckles that Putin must be having at our expense. Yeah. I mean, do you think, honestly, so I, I tweeted this, like, so India agrees to buy oil from Russia and we're going to tell the two of them what the price is? How does that work? <laughs> I, I honestly don't. And by the way, people think that when we're criticizing the administration and suggesting alternative policies, that somehow that's unpatriotic. It's the reverse. Right. Uh, hey, we'd like to win this war. Here's a, here's a way to do it. And somehow um, we're just supposed to shut up and obey um, as though we're not a free society with free speech and open political discourse, even at a time of war. Um, hey, we'd like to win this war. Here's a way to do it. If we started pumping, if we changed the whole mindset of the administration, if they worked with industry, you'd cut the price of oil in half. That would do more damage to Putin than all the theater we're doing right now, which only enables him. Yeah, I, th I just don't think they can go there because that- And they need to leave minds... office because like what are, what are leaders, but people who are supposed to set the tone and to lead the country to the desired outcome. This yeah, is hypocrisy. I just I just don't think they'll go there because in their minds, they see their constituents as people who are worried about climate change. So if they come out and said that, then there's just no way they can get reelected uh, because it's antithetical, antithetical to that narrative. I guess we'll find out what people care more about come November. Yeah, yeah. And it is interesting that now Germany is turning to coal. So maybe the the, the climate change politicians over there are choosing uh, to go against their constituents on that side to make sure that uh, you know the economy stays at a, a the, the economy doesn't go into a massive economic depression. Uh, also, I, I'd like to get your thoughts on just I believe today I read in the news that Russia is cutting off the Nord Stream pipeline for two weeks for maintenance. And I, I, when I read this, I'm like. Okay, is that Putin just saying, hey, Germany, just let me remind you what type of leverage we have. And then in the article, they suggested that there's some German officials that are basically crapping themselves right now because they think Putin may not turn the taps back on. Did you see that story? Yeah, it's a story we know well. I'd say on coal, before we jump into that question, um, where does Germany get its coal? Do you know? Russia. Oh, Russia. Okay. There of course. <laughs> and so there's an old clip floating around on YouTube, which is kind of funny, which is Putin cast, you know, uh, making fun of a bunch of European politicians. And he says, you know, um, if you're dismantling your nuclear, um, how are you going to get through the winter? Are you going to burn firewood? Um, and then he says, you know, you need the firewood from Siberia. So either way, like you're going to get our en your energy from us if you turn off your nuclear power plants. Now, this was pre-war. This was many years ago. Putin looks much healthier and thinner than he does now. He admittedly looks like he's got some kind of medical ailment. Um, but like, it's not like turning to coal, which is idiotic um, compared to the alternatives of building out nuclear and saving the plants they have. And but even with nuclear, aren't you still beholden to Russia? Because you, they, if, if my memory serves me right, they produce most of the enriched uranium. It and produces. a lot of the uranium comes from Kazakhstan, which is you know, under their control to a certain degree. Yeah, it's to a certain degree. But in the end, um, this is a own goal on the part of Germany. You could you could sort of look, there's lots of uranium in Australia. There's lots of, okay. you know, there's there's supplies to be had. There's a glut of uranium in the world, which is why this, you know, whole story about Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, which we won't get into, exists. So back to coal. 
um, this is whack-a-mole. So if everyone in the world decides they need coal because they can't have Putin's natural gas, what happens to the price of coal? Yeah. I'll tell you. <laughs> so in 2020, the price of coal, um, you know, generic first coal that you'd find on Bloomberg, Newcastle, you know, um, was $50 a ton. And today it's $400 a ton. Right. <laughs> right? Um, in the end, um, and we've talked about this many times in several of our pieces, um, there's a finite amount of energy that you need to produce to run the economy. And if you cut off Russia's oil and gas, there won't be enough. And this is just a fact. This is an axiom. This is why in Crazy Pills, we tried to lay it out, um, blasphemy that it was, that perhaps we should consider that we have more power over price than we do supply. And in fact, we would argue you don't want to cut off Russia's oil and gas because that will result in billions of people starving. And we don't want billions of people to starve. Maybe some people in the global warming movement do. We don't. We would like for as many people as possible to have as high a standard of living as possible. And you just can't do that without energy, which is why anti-nuclear environmentalists are anti-human hypocrites. They just are. There's just no other way to say it. They're either ignorant or they're anti-human hypocrites. So if uh, we decide we don't want natural gas and all of us want to replace uh, Putin's gas with coal, the price of coal goes up. There's no free lunch. And, and we wrote a piece um, a couple of weeks ago, just really remarkable situation where there's sort of two types of coal. There's thermal coal, which is used and burned to, um, to, make, um, to make electricity. And then there is coking coal, uh, which is yeah. used to make steel. Yeah, the same and steel used in windmills, by the way. Same steel used in all, you know, pick your favorite, <laughs> you know, um, the, the economy, like steel is used um, everywhere. And, um, yeah, we wrote a piece called um, Shoemaker's Children about Australia running out of electricity, even though it's a, a massive energy superpower. Um, so coking coal is cheaper than thermal coal, which is totally bizarre because coking coal is a higher quality coal. It's cleaner. It burns better. And that's why it's used to make steel. Like there's no reason why power plants couldn't just buy coking coal and make electricity with it. And forever, coking coal was more expensive than thermal coal. But the demand for coal is so abrupt and the market so disrupted that there is actually uh, for several weeks a pronounced price difference, which we can only attribute to the fact that the people that buy thermal coal don't know the salespeople at the cooking coal companies, like the supply mm. chain logistics just aren't worked out yet. Right. And so actually it bodes poorly for the economy for two reasons. There's a huge crisis in electricity production and there's going to be a comparatively a collapse in the production of steel, which we think is kind of both recessionary. Um, and so when we watch these markets and you see these signals, like coal, it's not like, oh, we just randomly go buy a bunch of cheap coal. Like coal is highly inelastic. Um, it wasn't but two years ago that every coal maker in the world was going bankrupt in the COVID crisis because the price of coal had collapsed and, and you know, um, climate change was going to put them all out of business and governments were. And now all of a sudden, these companies that either survived or emerged from bankruptcy are making, they're just printing cash. Right. Um, and then, of course, in the piece we talk about, uh, Shoemaker's Children, um, the Australian government comes in and puts effectively a windfall profits tax on the coal producers, which, by the way, the next time they need more coal, what's going to happen? There ain't going to be any mm. because nobody with any sense is going to put their investor dollars if it's heads I win, tails you lose. Um, and so nobody was bailing out these coal companies when they were going bankrupt. And now that they're actually making some money, you might be able to draw some much needed investor dollars into the space. The government comes in and, and radically increases the royalties they're charging Australian coal producers um, because they're making windfall profits that they don't deserve. Back yeah, to our right. conversation about crypto, you know, like the, say what you want about crypto, at least there's no government inter intervening and in doing that. Yeah. So you mentioned the word recession. And I, I just want to get your view today, the curve, the twos and tens inverted once again. And so you and I saw oil go below, I, I know it went below 100, it might have got down to 98 or so gold down to maybe 1750 1760 copper down below, I think 340. Uh, a lot of commodity prices down pretty much every single metric you see is kind of screaming recession. So I've looked at this as an opportunity, potential opportunity to buy commodities a lot cheaper. And uh, if you have a long-term view of a commodity super cycle, then uh, this could be a, just a, a, a fantastic opportunity 
Um, how do you see the recession kind of macro and then just narrowing that down to maybe an opportunity for commodities moving forward? Yeah. Um, so we put a chart out a couple of months ago on Twitter that showed, so the last time oil had a blow off top, and then that was months before the global financial crisis. You know, it, since energy is life and energy is so core to the economy, we've always known that um, an energy inflationary spiral inevitably leads to economic contraction because currencies, mm, right. they, they just overlay energy transactions. You know, the, currencies are, are designed to make um, transacting in energy efficient. And people think that's weird to say, but everything you buy is embedded energy. Food is energy. Fertilizer is energy. Purified water in your home is energy. The, the right angles in your house don't spontaneously occur. Your house is a huge store of energy that needs to be maintained with energy. Mm. Um, and so when you don't have sort of energy profit, you don't harness enough energy during the year, you must shrink. And so um, by definition, because your standard of living is defined by how much energy you get to waste. Um, and this sounds weird to say, but if you think about it long enough, that's sort of the fundamental axiom of, of, of the economy. And normal times we have excess energy and commodities are cheap and life is good and the economy can grow. And we're not in normal times. We have a pre-existing energy crisis because of the ESG movement and the crimping of inv needed investment of capital into that space, combined with Putin feeling like he was enabled by all the energy cards we gave him and his invasion of Ukraine has exacerbated a pre-existing crisis. Um, so in that environment, it is almost inevitable that we would have a pretty severe economic contraction. And um, I would say today's price action feels like um, a fund is blowing up. There's some rumors about a whale trapped in some in some derivative contracts in London that I saw on Twitter today. No, not sure how much to ascribe to it. It does feel a little bit forced, especially the price action in oil and gold. Um, and if you're long those things and you're blowing up, you sell what you can, not what you want to. And so, but the overarching view uh, of a commodity super cycle, it, it, we don't trade these markets because they're really impossible to time. Um, we, we sort of uh, like studying them and analyzing them and writing about them. Um, so it's hard for me to say. Uh, I would say that long term, I'm still very bullish on commodities. Um, I think we've not seen maximum stupidity yet in the energy policy of the politicians. Like, I think it's good to put it this way. Um, it's going to be a tough winter in Europe. Mm. And I think we've got a lot more pain to go. Um, really fascinating story in the natural gas market with this explosion at the Freeport LNG terminal, um, which is a lot of intrigue about and whether or not that was potentially a cyber attack. And if that's the case, then you could see significant escalation. We are seeing sort of spotty reports of energy complexes in Russia being attacked. And if that's a tit for tat on our part, that's just going unreported. Um, there's a lot more reasons to be bullish than to be bearish, but the day-to-day -day price moves like we've seen today, um, especially in gold. I, I, that one sort of um, seems very forced to me, but um, by and large, I, we're still very bullish in this. Put it this way, to be bearish energy is to be bullish logical thinking on the part of Western politicians. And we're not seeing enough of that yet. <laughs> yeah. Well said, very well said. Okay, we'll go ahead and end it on that note. <laughs> For people who want to find out more about what you do, where can they go, my friend? Yeah, first place to find us is doomberg.substack.com. Um, sign up there with your email and you'll get free previews to each of our piece. Better yet, sign up um, or paid newsletter now. Join the many thousands of paying subscribers that we have, which is really amazing. Uh, but alternatively, you can also follow us on Twitter at Doomberg T, as in team. Um, we do a lot of original posting on Twitter and a lot of retweeting and curating of, of the news of the day. Have a lot of fun on Twitter. We have... Um, as of the time of this recording, some 115,000 followers, which is really amazing as well. Um, so uh, doomberg.substack.com and at Doomberg T on Twitter. George, it's always a blast. Reach out anytime. Happy to come on and uh, congratulations on, on your continued success. Thank you. Can you also tell them about the podcast you do with Grant? Because I yeah. really, really like that one. Sure. So uh, Grant Williams, uh, grant-williams.com. Grant has his own suite of products and we're blessed to be a co-host on one of his many podcasts. Um, this week in Doom, we probably record one and a half episodes a month. Um, he also has the Grant Williams podcast. He has the end game with Bill Fleckenstein. He has um, the narrative game with Ben Hunt. And he has super terrific happy hour with uh, Stephanie Pomboy. He's got a real amazing uh, set of podcasts. Uh, the podcast for Grant, which goes to him, are, are, are $10 a month, uh, which is a steal. 
and um, really great guy. One of the best people in finance, as you know, super generous and um, really enjoy our conversations with Grant. Sometimes we have guests and sometimes it's just Grant and I, but This Week in Doom is a fun little podcast. Um, and so go over to grant-williams.com and sign up there as well. Awesome. Thank you for your time, my friend. Can't wait to do it again. You betcha. 